long, long day. I got a lot to say. It feels like I'm carrying a two-ton weight. I go to see a friend. Hello, I'm Monsignor Patrick Winslow, and I am Father Matthew Cowth, and we are speaking from the rooftop. A podcast brought to you by Ten Books, in which we invite you to join our conversation out here in the open air. Where we look out upon the world around us from the rooftop of the church and share with you what we see. Makes me wanna scream from the rooftop to the screen till I know I Well hello there. Greetings, how are you? I'm doing well. Don't fall over that rooftop. I'm on the edge. You're on the edge. I'm always You're on the edge. <laughs> Looking out. I'm always holding you back. I know. You're a very risky actor. <laughs> oh, I, do, I hate, I can't stand being on the edge of the heights. I, you know, I used to not be concerned about them at all. But as you know, I had that experience in Italy when I was stupidly free climbing and fell mm. off that mountain. And that was a many story fall that was saved miraculously. And ever since then, I my legs quiver a little bit when I get to the edge. Uh, yeah, well, I was born with that quiver. Okay. You know, well, my well, dad has it very honestly. Well, it's more like, rational than not, right? I mean, there's yeah. a reason that that quiver kicks in. It's saying you should not be doing this. Well, it's a little irrational when I'm watching on television. I see a, a ledge and I feel the quiver. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to fall through the television. But <laughs> it's that real. But it's amazing. I mean, do you remember when we would go skiing out west in, in Utah? And the place we went to in Alta at the time didn't have any bars going across the chairlifts yeah i know it's wonderful. i am sorry it's so i realize all out. the skiers everyone who's ski their whole life and all the oh you don't need bars it's safer without them no it is not safer remember you would make us put 50 our, feet remember in the what air. you would do make us put our poles Across and, my waist. Across your waist, you'd fit. And lock them in. And lock them in. <laughs> and I would like put my arms around the back. I'm, I'm sorry. No bar in front of you. I, it, some places were more than 50 feet high off the ground. You're the reason that kids have to wear helmets on bikes these days. Perhaps. Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. But that is dangerous, isn't it? Being too risk adverse oh. is not helping us. I'm not, no. Life's dangerous. No, no. Sitting in an open chair... 50, Listen. 60 feet in the air with nothing between you and the ground is, leads, is not and, normal. And the destruction that leads to you sitting in a rocking chair at the age of 50. Come on. That's normal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like Gosh, I'm, I'm, I feel nervous already just thinking and recalling. Yeah, that. Well. They, I want to say we have since learned that they put bars across those things. Yeah, even Ulta folded. Oh, what do you mean folded? They got wise. Yeah. If I were their insurance company, I would have pulled pulled their policy. That's why you're not insurance. Yeah. No, no. Listen, I I can, I can be risky. You know, I was at a parish. I wanted. For, <laughs> well, you put a little bit of regular in the decaf. <laughs> no, I, no, 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 no. Like for example, I remember. Now that I'm on this side of the diocese, I understand why I was rejected. But I wanted uh, to have go kart races over at St. Thomas right, for our, right, our for World Feast. World Feast, yeah. And I'm thinking, we need to get go-karts in here. We <laughs> have race around. Tricycle Is that, that right? <laughs> then we had to go to tricycles. <laughs> did we even put helmets on? I don't even know if we put helmets on. Our tri- of course we did not put helmets on. No, we didn't put helmets on. We were in tricycles. They were like adult-sized tricycles. Yeah. And then we had a little course that we did. But I wanted to get the golf, the, the actual like carts. Like, let's have races with yeah, carts. that would have been And of course, our, our properties office then rightly said, uh, yeah, that's a liability issue. Mm. Like, what? What? We can't even do race cars, like mm. go karts, you know. So the, I got a little riskiness in me. Well, I mean, that's, that's a, good, a risky that's a good business topic, right? I mean, when one is authentically living life, there are certain things that are worth risking for. Mm. And I think that the 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 payout versus the uh, the risk is a difficult thing to sort of adjudicate in one's in one's own mind which is why they typically say that you know you can't really develop any prudence until you're of a certain age etc when you're young Mm -hmm. everything looks possible and Mm -hmm. doable and then you get older and the older you get then you think everything's too risky well there is a certain biological thing that occurs in the brain right well sure development but but beyond that i mean so that says our friend father gober i mean he was born old born old risk adverse much more risk adverse than me yeah 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 yeah, that's yeah. true. But I mean, nothing really happens 
Um, you think about we, we look at these old pi- pictures. Did he say of, that he wasn't going to lend you money because <laughs> it was too risky? So yeah, that was it. I threw him under the bus here, but. Uh, Father Gober and I have been in the same uh, class since kindergarten. We've been friends since then. And, and somewhere in high school, I needed money to go out and uh, see a friend of mine. And I was flying out to California or something, and I was short like 60 bucks or something like that. And I said, hey, can you spot me 60 bucks? Now, back then, 60 bucks was a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he said no. And I, I knew he had tons of money because he never spent any money. Of course. And he worked. And we were in high school, and I said, "Are you kidding me? We've been friends all our lives." And he says, "You're a risky investment." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, You're not a good right. investment. I always paid my debts. I always yeah. paid my debts, but I was always broke because I was always doing something. Oh, yeah. Like, now he sold you money. down the river. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Risky. Anyway, so you were saying, did I already divert your thought? Well, no, no. I just was thinking about risk analysis. Right? We do this a lot. Um, we're trying to avoid all risks, and yet most of the things that we laud amongst men of the past were things that we wouldn't even consider doing. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking just about, you know, Shackleton going across Antarctica, which is one of the most amazing stories in history. Unbelievable. anything. Yeah. I mean, you think about what people were capable of doing in the old days for the purposes of exploring where you and I are living right now. Right. Um, What kind of adventurous spirit and, and the fact that this was worthy of throwing your life at. Those things are difficult, I think, to, to sort of adjudicate it. And I find that as we get older, we're so surprised we lived this long. Because now we have an expectancy to, to live long. Right. And then that we, we get used to being around. We get used to being around. And no one else little, did We start to be days. self-preserving. In the old days, they kind of did. Yeah. Right? Okay, we <laughs> didn't think about it. It was, it was just um, assumed. Yeah, now if someone dies at 70, you're like, oh, that's a shame. Right. Like, are you, what are you talking about? Like 70 is pretty, no offense to anyone, 70. I mean, I just turned 50. Right. And I think that everyone celebrates 50 traditionally um, because they realize, well, you won't be around another 50. <laughs> right. And if you get back, if you get back from the doctors and you have a diagnosis, we're not going to be as surprised as we once were. Exactly. Um, exactly. So, Although I think 70 is the new 60. Oh, yeah. All that. It's gone down 10 years to be sure. It's amazing. Yeah, I remember just, even when I was first ordained, you know, in the mid people dying in the mid 70s was kind of expected. But Fast forward, you yeah. know, twenty some odd years later, it's not the same. It's, I think eighties is the expectation. Yeah, I think I think yeah, I think the eighties yeah. is the new seventy. Yeah. But that sense in us that I've got to be a bit more careful now because I actually shouldn't have survived the things that I did. I mean, I look back at the things that I did that were somewhat foolish. Mm-hmm. Um not just foolhardy, um, but not calculated the best. Um some of my some of my favorite memories actually yeah and it, it it depends on what it's worth risking for I mean, if it's just for oneself one's adventure one's high that one gets it's a different thing than the kind of risks that you and i would have to take in a normal world where things aren't sort of taken care of for us well i mean well let's just i mean you like those alaskan shows for example that you yeah no to. exactly some of the greatest risks we take are interpersonal you know where mm. we become vulnerable to people mm. Uh, that you know, it's not it's not life and death in this in the same sense. But you know, when we become vulnerable to another person, I mean, there's a huge risk. Yeah, and I think that people are are probably more familiar with that terrain of risk taking, or for that matter, being risk adverse. And I think it, it causes people being risk adverse or self protective in the interpersonal realm it probably prevents a lot of growth it prevents a lot of relationships developing i mean you you can't whether it's a marriage whether it's a friendship or whether it's a relationship in the family vulnerability is an essential part of it and you can't mitigate it like you can't you can't control the vulnerability Either you're vulnerable or you're not. Sure. You can't say, I'm vulnerable, but yeah. I'm putting this wall up and this protective measure up. Well, then suddenly you're not vulnerable, <laughs> right? That you're invulnerable. Sure. And, and you lose something in that relationship. And we all know what it's like to feel crossed or manhandled, so to speak, in that, vulner- in that vulnerable space yeah. where we've been jostled because like, just a little something bruises a, little more, a lot more easily. 
Yeah. Like I would say to couples in marriage preparation, I'm talking about this, this measure of vulnerability. You know, if I said to you, pointing to the groom, will you just pass me the salt, kind of like in a bad attitude? Fine, here, take the soup of salt. Right? You would just kick it back to me and you move on. It would be no big deal. But if she said to you, you just pass me stupid salt. Wait a minute. We could be on the brink of World War II or World exactly. War III, rather. No, I mean, totally this different. is totally different. What realm someone lives the in. Same little, the same little jab is going to have a very different effect because of the vulnerability that the relationship or the space that you have, the interpersonal space that you have with one another um, creates. Yeah. Uh, and that's a tough terrain. I mean, I didn't mean to shift it from being risk adverse or risky no, but with it's, your own it's life. The but same it's, sort of thing it's the same sort of thing. It's the same stuff. It really is, just to make it um, full scale here, when our Lord speaks about you know, the loss of one's life, it is the prerequisite right, to, to actually getting into heaven. Mm-hmm. Um, that unless you lose your life, you know, you're not going to find it. And, and what does that mean? I mean, we can, we can abuse that statement insofar as we're talking about relationships, insofar as one allows their, um, themselves to be trampled upon interiorly in such mm-hmm. a way that it's sort of abusive, what have you. And we, we meet people like this, right, that, that have whatever the psychological uh, terms would be relative to someone that, that thinks so low of themselves that they want to be a doormat, to be abused, to be... Um, the person that is at everyone else's beck and call. They surrender to it. Um, they surrender to it. But it's, that's a different thing than giving your life. That is not giving. Yeah. Th- th- in that way, you give up. Yeah. You that's... resign. You, we've waved the white flag mm-hmm. and your territory is conquered. Right. And that can't be obviously what our Lord is speaking about. No, clearly it isn't. He's clearly he's clear talking about the actual gift of it. Well, when he and... walks away of the cross, you know, according to tradition, he falls three times. What does he do? Well, if I'm carrying a wooden instrument of execution on my back and I'm collapsing under its weight, knowing that when I arrive at the location, I know, it's going to be worse. I'm going to be you know, <laughs> nailed to it, I would just collapse and stay, stay right. and let them finish me now. Right. Right? I mean, it's going to be horrible either way. It would be a little quicker if I drop. Um, why do you get back up? Yeah. Well, because he's laying down his life. Yeah. He's not giving up. Yeah, no one takes There's my a life huge from difference. me, he says, right? Mm-hmm. I lay it down freely. He's laying down his life. So and, he was in pursuit. And then we could also say clearly that in most of our, as you mentioned with the salt example, in most of our relationships, um, there isn't that sort of commitment to the person that we meet at the grocery store that there is with the person that we actually part of our right. family and our persons we've chosen to be friends with, right. etc. And that's the realm in which we're, we're sort of literally on a daily basis kind of laying down our lives and being willing um, to be hurt by another for the purposes of, of actually loving. Um, but there's all cor- sorts of, as you like to say about onions, there's all sorts of layers to that. Like how... How deep is one into your sort of right. circle? Although, I, occasionally a driver hits me to the core. On the way, I was driving in. I'm like, you are so rude. You did not let me in for no apparent reason. Yeah. Other than, no, you're not getting in. I'm not letting you in. I was just, I went from zero to 60 on the inside. I was thinking about that recently. You know, because you, you meet so many people in the course of a day. You're never going to see again. Yeah. And so part of my attempts I don't succeed a part of my attempts is to try to keep reminding myself that's the only time I'm going to encounter, encounter that person probably in this life mm-hmm. and what was the encounter mm-hmm. I'm a priest etc right and so I was I was on a road here in Charlotte and the traffic in Charlotte has just gotten horrendous yeah and um, these cars were queuing up to pick up kids from Montessori school and I was at Blackhawk and Park Road Shopping Center. I was right. heading over to St. Anne's. So I was taking the back road there, not realizing that all these cars queued up in a snake mm. on both sides of the road. So the only place you could actually drive on that road was down the center. Mm-hmm. And someone was poking out into the center. Mm. So I, I, I was committed I couldn't turn around at that point unless I backed up all the right. way. You're Long gonna... story short, I asked him if he could just pull up a little forward so I could get by him. And he said, No. 
Hmm. And I said, um, just just right there. He said, I'm not going to block that driveway. I'm like, no, well, you can go right back where you were. I just need to get past you. And then I'm not waiting for someone. To, I'm not picking up anyone at the school. I'm just I'm just driving through. And he just looked back down at his phone. So I got out of the car. I think I scared him, you know, thinking I was going to be aggressive. I just thought he didn't understand what I was asking. And so I went up to the car and I said, could you just move up here just a little bit so I can get by? And he just says, well, I guess it's just all about you, isn't it? <laughs> I was wow. like, what are you talking about? I'm just... <laughs> Just and I thought to, to myself... It was I, no difference to him, right? It was no difference, right? It didn't make any difference to him at all. Right. Um, but he was trying to make a point. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just stood there for a moment, completely dumbfounded. Right. Thinking, these are our normal relations. Yeah. And I can, I can react in a number of different ways here. But I was so struck by the fact that, that the abrasiveness that we have our normal relations now, because yeah. we don't have many. At those small moments, and I, maybe I'm getting off topic here, but those small moments when we're talking to the clerk at the grocery store or we're making connection with someone, people don't have those anymore. Well, it's a violation of a social contract, right? The reason why we have niceties, the reason why we have manners, the reason why we have certain formalities is to lubricate society. It's, an, it's intended to, it's a sort of a social, general social contract. We all kind of know the rules. And when someone violates it, uh, it it goes past the exterior and kind of hits to the heart. And you realize that was a serious affront. Now, objectively, it's not serious in the sense what we're taking just a little bit longer to wait for the car to move. But it was serious in a social arena, in a, in a social level right. or dimension, because it was kind of a violation of our norms. It's a violation of how we interact. Like, you know, if I'm sitting there and somebody wants to get by, I usually... Don't even have to wait to be asked. Oh, we're trying. Right? I look. I exactly. It's kind of what you do. Yeah, and that's you know not not sort of a Lockean right. Know, so contact, it's not so much an issue of vulnerability. The fact that we're in a, we we live with persons, right? And for this thing to actually work, we do actually have to treat other persons the way we would treat someone with whom we are vulnerable. Right. This is kind degree. of what we do in society. Yeah. Which is why it's so difficult when you go to a different culture and you're unfamiliar with the customs and the norms and the niceties. And the formalities, and even the formalities of language, of using formal versus informal, you know, and there some languages are more complex relative to their formal structures, but it lubricates society. It's it it, it serves a very important function and purpose. Uh, it it enables all of us to be on the same page, and we do feel when someone is outside of those norms, yeah. a, a certain personal front and a, and a corporate front, right? Like right. Like, who does that? The reason why we're asking that, who does that, is because we're bringing in the rest of society. Yeah. And you know, we're saying, as a measure... Testify to this. Yes. Be a witness to as this. As a measure, we, we don't do this as a yeah. people. Um, well, and you're violating that norm, and we feel aggrieved. Well, it goes to show the you the wisdom of the simple statement of our Lord, right? Or that doing unto others as you would have them do. Yeah. It's a very simple rule. Isn't it? That... How would I expect and yet, desire to be treated in this situation? You don't really live up to it with me. Well, because our Lord has instructed me. <laughs> a private revelation. A private revelation <laughs> that you need. A special Your father has treatment. spared you the rod and spoiled oh, the child. Oh, believe me. So this is your dad's problem. My dad has a special rod. <laughs> it's incessant. It's called a microphone. It's incessant teasing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he taught us all. All right, so let's go back to the vulnerability lane because... I think I do feel and think that people spend a lot of energy on their relationships. You know, they, you know, where are their minds? You know, what's occupying? We are, we, we live where we love. Right. That's it. You know, exactly. We are bound up in our relationships. And the more vulnerable we are in our relationships, the easier we're hurt, we're wounded, yep. we're offended. And, the easier it is for our faults to emerge. So, for example, it's one thing to be vulnerable at a level if somebody, especially if somebody's doing something that's a little bit off or inconsiderate, but it's another to have a vulnerability that isn't just a vulnerability because I'm in a deeper, closer relationship with a person. But it's because it's rooted on um, an insecurity, 
it's it's rooted on a, it's rooted this vulnerability is it's like more like a bruise yeah it's it's rooted in a wound so it's not just because this is a deep interpersonal relationship and a little slight move causes mm-hmm. just a bit more of a, a feeling a jibe but if I have a wound in that area a bruise it's exacerbated a hundredfold and so uh, somebody with a fault, you know, let's use me as an example. Sorry well, if I just that, hit the that's microphone. Pretty, that's pretty glaring. Yes, yeah, shush. So if I just, I don't know if I just scraped the rope. I, I use my hands when I talk. Well, it was dramatic for you to say that, right? When you said, take me, for example. Take me, for example. I, I, yeah, and I pull my hands up. It's not singular, by the way. It's plural, but keep going. Or whatever. So um, nice if somebody fault. does something, you know, with whom I'm in a, a close friendship or somebody right. in my family, and it hits... We might say a nerve, but it's not a nerve because the nerves are supposed to be there. It's more like a bruise. It's a wound. And it's it, oftentimes people talk about it as triggers. Sometimes, you know, you know, we say, you know, it, it, it just hit me in a certain way. Right. What can happen is my reaction is so disproportionate that it's unjust. That my reaction right. is crazy off the wall. Now, the the person on the receiving end of it or any observers are going to think, what just happened? They just lost their mind. They just popped, you know, or something like that. And what really happened is the person themselves, like in this case me, would look to blame some, you know, to say you were the cause. Yeah. But if I'm truly honest, I am 90% of the cause. You're ten percent. You hit it, but it's because it's a wound that it, it because hurt that it's bad. so bruised. If it wasn't bruised, it wouldn't have hurt that bad, right? Yeah, sure. And and you have to own that. Yeah. You know, otherwise relationships get so entangled. Uh, it's, like, they, it's like patting someone on the back when they've got a massive sunburn. They didn't yeah, know. They didn't. And know. you scream. <laughs> and you scream at them. And you, did, did they do it? Yes. But your reaction is proportionate to the to the pain. Right. Right to the pain. And you can be frustrated with the pain, but you can't be mad at the person, yeah. right? Because, all right, so maybe the person shouldn't have t- you know, slapped you a little hard in the back, but it was good natured. It wasn't meant to be, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. But if you then turn around and start punching the person that did that, right? That's well, this not is, uh, right. This is you know just talking about. Really solid friendships. You have talked about before about you get to a point with your friends like I'm in for life. This is just it. You know, let's just skip the fighting and we're, start talking. We're just because we're going to be in it for life. We're not going to break this thing up. No. Um, and it's even more so with the case of the kind of friendship that is that is marital, right? When you've got a vow. Yeah, you're very vulnerable, and you're extremely so, and you're constantly hitting someone whether you like it or not, where they're bruised. And unfortunately, we also know where the person is bruised, where we can just tap tap. Yeah. And it's going to cause them a lot of pain. And then they and then tap, like, tap and, back. And you're like, what? What? Yeah. All I said was. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah. And it tap, tap back. And then you're in a spiral, right? Yeah. And, it, and it's it, it's so important to recognize these things. Yeah. Uh, I think that a lot of marriages run into big challenges because it's not just the relationship that needs work and effort, but you are an instrument a purification right. for each other, right. Right. which means right. you have to change. You have to be on the path of growing and becoming better. Yeah. You have to fight your demons. Yeah, we, tell, we tell couples this, right? And in, I, I live in a different world in the seminary where I, I, I came out of a world talking to couples about marriage prep saying that this means that the person to whom you're marrying, right, I don't want to say it's the cross per se, but it kind of is, right? You're, you're, you're marrying the instrument mm-hmm. that's going to bring you purification. And yet we don't, I'm in a different world now talking to the seminarians about this insofar as that you don't finish seminary and then you're sort of a finished product mm-hmm. such that you're going to get out there and be the perfect priest and have yeah, the I'm done with the cross. On the cross contrary, done, yeah, yeah. it's the faithful that are going to be the mm-hmm. thing that purifies you. Your yeah. actual responsibility to your work, your labor in the field, and their, you know, their, both their good treatment of you and their mistreatment of mm-hmm. you. That's going to expose those things, and it's going to be the purifying agent. You actually doing your job, exactly, or in living your vocation. Yeah, you know, and 
I like to tell couples uh, at their at their weddings in particular during the homily is to say that they will not only bring out the best in each other, but the worst, but the worst, yeah, and that it's meant to it be. It needs to happen, and it's a sign of a marriage not failing but working. Yeah, uh, but the marriage fails in the sense that the relationship starts to disintegrate um, when the the individuals don't start owning up to the problems that they're bringing. Yeah. You, you have to, and it's vulnerable, it's hard, it's humiliating, it's painful, but it, I know of no other way. Yeah. And, it's, and let me just be the first to say, it's not just people who are married. Right. Right? This, this is the way of the cross. All of us have internal defects that need to surface to be able to be addressed, healed, wounded, I mean, uh, um, bound, you know, the yeah. wounds bound, and ultimately glorified yeah. in the manner of our Lord's. So, you know, we've always commented on the fact that, that in iconography, the saints are always shown with their the instruments of their torture, right? right? You know, I just was looking at an image of St. Lucy recently, you know, she's got her, her eyeballs on a plate, you yeah. know, and... Um, whether it's the cross or the sword or the pinchers or the, right. whatever the thing might be, that which caused them the most amount of pain became the thing that we sort of exalt in, in heaven, at least for the martyrs, right? Right. But the same thing is true for all of us in some degree. And I think it's it's hard for us to, to accept that, that the thing that is the place where we're the most broken can, God can make all things new and desires to. That can be the, that will be the very thing should you pursue it. Mm-hmm. That is the thing that you're going to hold in some sense in heaven and say, "He did this. Look what he mm-hmm. made out of this. This is almost like it's a trophy as opposed to the thing that you want to keep in the back of the closet, um, or hide, or be ashamed of, or whatever else. The brokenness that you've got. What once it's, owned you, gonna, you now own. Yeah, it's going to manifest his glory and, and manifest his glory. Yeah, right. it's a good place to pause. That's a good place to pause for now. Yeah, sir. that's good. I think we were just talking about risky. Risky endeavors. You never know where we're going to go. Well, well, never. We never know where we're going to go. <laughs> so, that's true. <laughs> All right. So, what's your before you go? I, you know, I just every time I see people and they're talking about, hey, Father, I was listening to the from the rooftop or whatever. I, I get asked a lot. I'm not sure about you. If you do, do you guys really just start talking? I'm like, yes, yes, we do. That's what we do. <laughs> I've actually had people say, "Why didn't you flesh this?" I'm like, "Well, we didn't." put together a syllabus exactly you know that's not what we were doing yeah uh it really it, we are as build i can tell you that much yeah that being said if anyone does have a topic they want us to just muse on happy to do so or if we skated over something yeah, or you glossed over something some, yeah that you want us to kind of you know circle back to we're happy to you know i i think we try to stop each other if we're assuming some things that maybe we shouldn't i think i do that more with you this is true uh i live in a, more of an academic world right now you do I live in a very practical world. Yeah. Um, but that said, it's it's easy enough to kind of gloss over, especially with our own common lexicon, you know, the things yeah. that we talk about. I can just simply say one word and it, a whole slew of concepts come your way. Yeah. And then you piggyback on that. And right. So it, sometimes it's hard to listen to other people's conversations because there's insider language, there's context and background. But, right. you know, we have to do, we, we do, we, I think we're doing our best to kind of fill it in. Yeah. Well, to fill it in. Before we go, Father. Yes. Well, it is October, mm. which means we need to be thinking about thinking the winter. About, you're thinking about candy. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I always think about candy, so I don't need to wait for October. Uh, that said, I, I, I know this has become really particular about candy. You have? I really have. Wow. I've become world weary. Okay. Um, so I'm... Because you were... You were a port in port any storm. Yeah, I was a port in any storm, yeah. I'd take a teaspoon of sugar and if I needed to. Now, that's gross. I, I wouldn't do that. I would melt it down in water and make rock candy. Mm. <laughs> but that said, I have never done that, at least since I was a kid. I was taught, in, in, in school, they taught us in science class how to make rock candy. Uh, you know, is, anyway, I did that as a kid. I haven't done that since. I'm not that bad. Okay. But... I was thinking about winter coming around the corner, and there is the uh, ski season that is emerging, and I think we got to start putting some plans together and 
be able to come back after a little ski trip mm. and tell people about our experience. Oh, I'd be happy to. I I love skiing. It's one of those sports you can still do as you get older. The problem is that I haven't aged in my mind. And so mm. last year I was able to ski quite a bit, actually for about a week and a half with some family and stuff. And and I did some really precarious... Uh, what about a six-week recovery? Uh, no, I, I never got hurt, Okay, um, thankfully, but I should have. Yeah. And I, I don't know how to slow that down. Yeah, you're um, going to have to attenuate. Because here's what happens. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you, because I, you know, I do have, what, three or four years on you. You get uh, just three, I think. Right? Is it just whatever? Yeah. I've got just, a, just a, a tiny bit of a preview for you. Um, and as you, but I think you've, you've experienced it too. It's like when you're hitting the moguls, it takes, at least at the level that I can, at least at the level that I can ski them, it takes a fair amount of muscle in my legs. Yeah. Now, I go over a few of them and I'm pushing the muscle and then in an instant, they stop responding. <laughs> in an instant. You run out of gas. <laughs> and then the next thing you know, you're coming over the top of a mogul and it becomes a launch pad. Mm-hmm. It becomes a jump. Yeah. And you start, you go, and you fly up in the air. Can you do that sound effect again? <laughs> <laughs> fly up in the air well, so it's it's one of those you have you, you have no recourse yeah. when your legs don't respond because there is nothing left in them yep. it's a bit scary you know it's really hard to believe that we ever get to the point where there's nothing left in our legs after the extensive amounts of workouts that we do all year long well, considering how these <laughs> you know how, how these very muscular legs uh you know, exists that are only it's, ever it's used to, to 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 hold down an ottoman. <laughs> That's right. So obviously, we're talking only about seven hours of constant skiing. Only after seven hours do I ever get no. that. No, but the truth is, it could be like five minutes. No, I mean it's the the the, the enjoyment to power ratio uh, to energy ratio on moguls is is at the point now where I yeah I don't enjoy them as much. And it's a bit scary in the sense that we are so accustomed to speed, yeah. and we're not trying to. S- speed past people but you know as you increase in your your ski or your skier life you become very comfortable with speed and you just kind of move it along but if you yeah. stopped and considered how fast you're going and you've got trees to the left trees to the right people over here people over there you know bumps here you know you think this is kind of treacherous it is this is kind of treacherous. A, to, to, to sum up our earlier, it's a it's a risk worth taking. It is a risk worth taking. Wow, <laughs> beautifully done. All right, your last thing then. Well, I just remember speaking of other winter sports. Remember last was the last year, the year before skating. we took the seminarian skating. Yeah, and that was horrible. I hated. Yeah, well, here's why it was especially horrible. It was it was like post COVID. Well, it was it wasn't post COVID. It was sort of the end of COVID. So they didn't have anything to sharpen the skates. So we were not on sharp skates. I, exactly. So to be on skates, I've never done that before. Basically, skates that have never been sharp. They have no edge. And yeah. And it was absolutely it was like miserable. Riding and I on would spoons. like to go back because we used to play hockey on the ponds when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I would like to, this winter, um, engage in a little bit of that again on with some proper skates. All right. And get back on the skates and... and that would be a lot of fun. Done. Yeah, I would enjoy that. Yeah, so. that was fun. I, I, I'd like to do that again. There might even be like a, I know there are, there are rinks around here because I, yeah. I know that uh, at least one of our priest friends, he would do pick a poppy hockey right. games. Right, hockey games, yep. You know, here, there. And so there's got to be a rink around. All right, That's get ready it. for All your right. Winter Olympics. Here we come. Oh, you know me. I love watching the winter sports. <laughs> you too. <laughs> All right. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. And, ciao, ciao, uh, everyone. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. me Thanks for listening to this episode of From the Rooftop. For updates about new episodes, special guests, and exclusive deals for From the Rooftop listeners, sign up at rooftoppodcast.com. And remember, for more great ways to deepen your faith, check out all the spiritual resources available at tanbooks.com. And we'll see you again next time. From the Rooftop. Rooftop.